Um, today we're going to be talking about, I suppose, a, a topic that's coming up for organizations and, and HR people and HR leaders really throughout the world, not just in Ireland. It's it's sort of what we're talking about is balancing performance management with, um, with workplace well-being and how we get, I suppose, the most out of I suppose uh, our, our teams, uh, while you know, making sure that we don't pressurise and, and and do that too much. Um, delighted to welcome two guests uh, today: uh, Kevin Green, all the way from sunny London. Morning, Kevin. How are you? Morning. I'm fine, thank you. Good. Uh, Kevin previously was HR director for the Royal Mail in the UK. Um, was CEO of the Recruitment and Employment Confederation for. Uh, uh, for over over 10 years and advises and I suppose some of the UK and Ireland's uh, largest company he's worked with with us in FRS for for over two years um, and really has some some uh, good things to say around people leadership and that we've also got Shane O'Sullivan um, high performance coach welcome uh, welcome Shane how are you good Colin good uh, former Waterford hurler um, are you in Waterford today Shane you're Waterford today by the grace of God. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, so just before we kick off, the, uh, I just saw Ke Kevin. Kevin is an Arsenal fan, right? So he's the worst sort of sort of football fan you can come across. Tippy tappy sort of football and all that sort of thing. Uh, Kevin Shane is a hurler, right? So it's it's. I don't know whether you've had a chance to look at any videos uh, or that, but Waterford would sort of be like. The Wimbledon of hurling, we would say, uh, you know, the Wimbledon, the Wimbledon of, of hurling, yeah. Careful now, <laughs> the crazy um, gang, yeah. But but look, uh, you know, tonight have I think Shane, you've played at high. I think you've played in one All Ireland final, have you? One All Ireland final, yeah, yeah. two thousand and eight. Yeah, who bet you that was? Kilkenny. Kilkenny. Kilkenny, Kilkenny me the same uh, day. But... Uh? convincingly, actually, on the yeah. same day. But uh, we uh, sure look. But I, I suppose, and, and one of the, the key reasons we've got Shane on, and I suppose gives us an insight to that sort of, in, you know, high performing um, sports teams, how, how, what happens to people when you put pressure on them, you bring them into new environments and, and, um, and that type of thing. So look, we'll, we'll, we'll kick off, I, I suppose what we're seeing out in, in, in the marketplace is an un unprecedented sort of change and challenge um for organizations so kevin we'll, we'll kick off with you like you're advising over 20 companies across the uk um and some in ireland what what's actually happening on the ground with i suppose from a practical perspective with with leaders of organizations on the hr side and and you know i suppose ceos and, and chairs of companies and what are they changing? You know, how is it impacting their teams on the ground, and what does good look like? And, and I suppose are you seeing bad stuff as well? Yeah, uh, uh, lots of things going on. I mean, I think the 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 the, the, the starting point is, I suppose, that it's got to become a bit of a cliche, but it's unprecedented. You know, this is a very different from other sort of business or economic crisis. Most of the time when you have a recession like in what we had in 2008 through 2010, organizations have six months as a lead up to that, you know, a debate about are we going to have a recession? Are we not going to have a recession? And what leaders are then starting to do is prepare for that downturn. So they're trying to right size the organization, make sure their balance sheet is strong, make sure they're thinking about how they compete, what markets they want to be in. But this crisis is very different. You know, uh, one minute it was normality and then the following week, you know, people were locked down and having to work from home. So what you we had to deal with at the very beginning of the crisis was a lot of leaders being quite panicked. You know, so I ended up having lots of conversations with leaders that wanted to make really quite big decisions. And so one of the things as an advisor was just to try and get people to reflect, be calm, think things through. Um, and not make hasty decisions. Second thing was, I suppose, is that, you know, the whole remote working thing. So not only were we in a crisis, but people's top teams were all of a sudden scattered. And so they were having to work in a different way. And again, I, I think you've got to remember that sort of 60 to 70 percent of communication is um, is physical. It's nonverbal. And so I think a lot of people were having to get to grips with how do we operate as a team? You know, when we're all scattered to, you know, different parts of the country and we're really having to think at pace through some big decisions. So the first couple of weeks, it was panic um, uh, with a, a, a bit of reflection and HR directors playing a role to calm people down and to get them to think things through. But clearly the big issue at the beginning was about liquidity. 
You know, how do we get the business from where we are now to the other side of the crisis? And so a very big focus on cash. So chasing debtors, making sure you, you have enough money in the business, not paying the government, uh, whether it's national insurance or um, uh, VAT payment. So a focus on liquidity. Then you get to the two other big areas of cost. Firstly, I suppose it's premises and negotiating on those. But then you got to the people costs. And I think people made many of them made the right decision, which was a, a focus of taking people with us and trying to get as many people to the other side still with jobs in the organization. And I know both in Ireland and in UK, you had this um, sort of furloughing scheme where people are being paid to um, if they, you know, their job would have been lost normally. So, and, and I think that has created some stuff where organizations are having to communicate and engage um, their workforce because what people do in a time of crisis, they look to leaders and managers to create clarity, you know, uh, revisit purpose. This is what we're here to do but to tell people and to reassure people about what's going on. So first phase is make sure the business can get to the other side. Second phase, particularly if people are working differently and you're having to furlough staff is to try and communicate and engage people, you know, keep the communications quite frequent, uh, make them a little bit snappier, but make sure you're listening, you're asking questions and getting people to return. Um, I think there's a recognition now four or five weeks on that well-being is under pressure. There's no doubt the studies show that four weeks of working at home creates issues around isolation and feelings of loneliness. And some people don't get that. If you're in a family, you know, there's lots of people in the house. But let's not forget, in lots of the cities, there are people that live on their own. So they won't have been out very much other than to do a bit of shopping. And all of a sudden, their whole life is via Zoom or crowdcast or whatever it may be. So I think there's a lot about how do you engage, motivate, inspire uh, people when you're using a different medium. So I think leaders have been trying to adapt and learn to that. Um, I think your final point was what does good and bad look like? Well, bad, I think, is not engaging, not spending enough time talking, not spending enough time listening. Um, I also think that organisations that have uh, not filled the vacuum. You know, people are uncertain. They're not sure of what's going to happen. I think the more that you can create a picture and a narrative of where you're going and what the next few weeks looks like, the more likely you are at taking people with you. So I think, you know, this four or five week period has been really tough for leaders and organizations, but I think most of them have, have risen to it. So I've seen more good practice than I've seen bad. I've seen people struggling, but learning at pace, you know, learning to do things differently. So I think most organizations have recognized this is unprecedented. They really are keen to uh, help people through this and they're trying to do the right things by the organization and by the people. Um, I do think we have got a, a challenge going forward because if things don't go back to normal quickly, then I think businesses are gonna have some more tough uh, decisions to make um, and they need to do that in a thoughtful, reflective, um, balancing up, looking at the data and the evidence, but also making sure that they communicate, engage and really try and take their people with them. Very good. Um, just before I come on to you, Shane, just for um, the audience, we've been a lot of people online there. On the right hand side of your, your screen, you can you can ask some questions um, of, of the panelists. Um, and also we've got a poll. It's quite a binary poll. So it's it's very much just to, to what comes first, you know, performance management or workplace well-being and i know you'll be inclined to go well they go together but just for you what what really is the number one or what's the uh, what's the starting point um shane just that you deal with an awful lot of people from a management perspective um hello sharon by the way sharon just popped in there um uh and i uh Shane, you, you you deal you deal with a lot of people individually, right? So you, you I suppose, and you see challenges that. So what happens to people's mindsets during a time of immense, I suppose, change and crisis, and and how does pressure coming from leadership impact people really, you know, on the ground, and and um, what is typically the, the normal reaction to that? Yeah, very good question. So there's five different responses to the stress that people are feeling right now. So the fight 
the fight or flight response that we're all familiar with that would have happened many thousands or millions of years ago. So you see a danger that you have to run or you have to fight like hell to survive. So that's the, the first two responses. The third response then is the freeze response. So it's, oh, I'm not really sure what to do now. And people are kind of stuck in the moment without having a prospective hope of the future or have clear actions about what they can do in the new situation that they've never experienced. And then the fourth response is, is a submission for people obviously within a deep stressful environment that they might be going through now, they give up and they tend to uh, repel away from organizations or they, they close up and they don't communicate with their leadership or with everyone in their organization. But the fifth response, and it's something that I'm really, really interested in, and it happens and it's happened a lot in the last four weeks is the flow, the flow response. And it's, it's very, very interesting if you look at the research on this dating back to all the way back to after World War II, Mihaly Zixent Mihaly did massive research on the flow state. And he had a curious question in his own village after World War II, when something similar was happening in a world like it is now, obviously destruction and challenge, et cetera, et cetera. He had a curious insight as a young boy and he saw two sets of people. One set of people after the war were thriving. They were really engaged. They had new ideas, they had new energy and they had passion and purpose in their work. And then the other set of people, unfortunately, they couldn't get over the challenge, the destruction, the terror, the death that they experienced. And he was curious. So he just 20,000 interviews across the world, various people, all kinds of walks of life, from skiers to farmers to teachers to engineers, etc. And he concluded that, quite simply, that the greatest moments in our life or the greatest moments in our working life when we're actually in that flow state and we're performing is when our minds or our bodies are challenged to the limits of its potential. And that's the flow state. And I would have been researching this and working through this for years, but I can see that now with people more than ever before. And a key, in, a key insight in that is that stress and the interpretation of it is really important. Stress is necessary for high performance. Stress is necessary for the flow state, but it's important that we keep that within the stretch zone and not the panic zone. So for leaders and organizations, when we talk about this situation, stress can often be a really good indicator of our fuel for us to think different, to create new insights and to grow to places we've never been before. And that's not to lose the other four elements of the panic response, the fight, flight, freeze, and submission, because that's real, and that's also happening in the current situation. Uh, sh what what helps people get in the flow state, Shane? How do you get? So if you you know you can see your team, you're looking at a team as a couple that are thriving and flying and doing, coming up with great ideas, but others are frozen. People are getting a bit fearful, not talking, getting inside themselves. How do you get people into the flow zone? As a T, as say you're the chief exec or the MD or the HR director, how do you support the ones that are struggling rather than the, you know, how do you get them out of that and into the flow? Great question. And if you if you look at it from an objective point of view, it's first principles, and it's actually looking at okay, what's the fundamental building blocks of a person's flow state? So we often look at a flow state like Maslow talked about the self actualization high performance, and we always look for the 10%, maybe even in our past, in our organizations or ourselves, what's that extra little bit, that extra learning, that extra habit, that extra insight that I can do now that makes me better. But really where the gold is at is the bottom 90%. And there's really significant research in widening the window of resilience to move into that flow state or stretch zone. And there's a lady called Elizabeth Stanley, Dr. Elizabeth Stanley in Georgetown University. And she wrote a book recently called Wide in the Window. I'd really recommend it. But her first principles in getting a foundation to the flow state is basically self-awareness, exercise, sleep, nutrition, and social connection. And if we take that, those five key variables those foundational levels and we look at our organizations and our people and we get that right well then we can move into that stretch zone and that opportunity to be our very very best even in the challenging environment we're in now very good and and shane when you were i suppose when you were hurling 
you know, at a very high level, both both sort of um, county and and obviously with with your club Bally Gunner, you won Munster championships and all that sort of stuff. How did that manifest itself in a in a team? Well, for you, I suppose, and individually first, and how did that work potentially with different leaders and different and different managers of those teams and different styles of uh, management? Yeah, very good question. So, it obviously it changed. It evolved over. I hurled for 15 years and I'm still hurling. So at a high level, the, the mindset of the leader changed. So originally it was like push, do more, get fitter, get stronger, and that will result in high performance. But that model now is broken. So the best managers and the best leaders now understand that it's like a thriving to inspire model, whereby mm -hmm. work hard, focus work, recover harder, so that you can come back and work and perform harder the second or the third time. And that recovery now is an integrated part of all high performing teams in sport or also in business. And that's the simple concept of the space, the social connection, the sleep, the self-awareness, having the space to have coaching or to engage with people and have communication from a leadership down. These are the key, in, key impacts that can, can happen on the recovery phase. And I think that model has transitioned, Colin, between 20 years ago and what it is now. I think it's completely changed. I'm interested to hear your own viewpoints on that from a leadership perspective. Yeah, I, I think from a flow state perspective, I think I talked to you before about a chain um, in 2005, I learned I was going to have a set of triplets, right? And uh, it's just a sort of funny sort of personal sort of example. I had three kids. I was, I was, as my mother said, I was taking a shortcut to get to six. Um, <laughs> and, um, but mentally, it had an amazing sort of an effect on me that it was almost like an out of body sort of experience that these children were coming along and I was going to have to sort of provide for them. And that was the initial type of thing. I, it was just, it wasn't a, I, I'm not one for sitting as Kevin would tell you and, you know, planning and, and all that sort of, oh, he gives me a bit of stick over it, but I think I'm quite a gut sort of person. And it was just this overarching sort of look drive that sort now look I, I you know I, I i you know i'm quite sort of driven anyway but i just went into a sort of a different sort of level and in in my own individual performance at the time for and for a number and for a number of years you know and uh it it sort of it, and when i look back it was quite difficult to actually understand what created that but it was sort of using that to sort of drive on from there and understanding that that had happened and i played relatively high sort of sport as well and it, that sort of thing when you get up to winning sort of 30 games on the trot and that type of thing it's almost like you know like liverpool at the moment and what Klopp has instilled in them it's this just unbeatable sort of piece and it through any type of adversity it, it happens but i think a lot of it is is driven from the leader side and kevin i was going to ask you there like stanley mccrystal talks about this like the the american general of new forms of leadership which obviously command and control started at, at you know with the army and 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 forces which and now the U.S. Army has moved, and when they were in Iraq, they moved to this decentralized sort of leadership structure, giving much more autonomy on the ground. Have you seen much of that happening, I suppose, in a, in a business sense? Because it's hard for leaders to, a lot of the time just to let go, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, I think, there's, I think there is a recognition that command and control doesn't work. I think, you know, there's a, there's a recognition that we need people um to make decisions closer to the action whether that's closer to customers closer to managing the people within the organization so you want an organization which is more responsive to its environment you know more agile and you can't do that if it's command and control particularly if it's a large organization you know a group at the top of the organization cannot make every decision you have to actually disperse power down to people making sure that they have the skills now the role of leadership in that context is about direction, narrative, value, some core things that hold the organization together uh, and create a direction. And then what you need to do is give power to people further down the organization to make decisions so they're closer to customers or clients. They're the ones that are listening to their staff. 
listening to great ideas that they have about what the business should be doing to improve and get better. So I think there's a recognition that that's a direction of travel and more organizations are recognizing that and investing more in management, development and coaching and development to empower people to operate in that environment. In a crisis, though, and that's what's interesting, is there is a real pushback where people go, actually, oh, we're in a crisis. We may not get through this. Let's bring all the power back to the center. Let's get a small team making every decision. Now, in a very short term, that can be quite helpful because it speeds up decision making. But what I've seen quite, you know, over the last four weeks is people recognize quite quickly that they need to spend more time listening, being very empathetic and creating directions. So what I've seen with a couple of my clients is they've already moved through that cycle, gone, OK, we've steadied the ship. We know how we can get the cash. This is the broad direction. We need to make sure that we've got the right people making the right decisions as close to the action. So I think you're in a normal circumstances, the direction of travel is quite clear. Empowerment, um, giving people more responsibility and accountability. Um, but what I think we're also starting to see was in a crisis, there's this all of a sudden reversal. Let's go back to type. Let's go back to command and control. But I think the right organizations are the ones that recognize that may be short for the, for the short term, but then go back to making sure that people can make the right decisions. Shane, at the right place at the right time. Yeah. How have you seen that manifest itself in sports, Shane? Like, the, you know, in the sense of, I suppose, you get some managers, I remember you'd go out and you'd have specific sort of instructions, you know, and then you have others who sort of say, look, just go out and play the way you want to play, you know. So how, the, how have you seen that manifest itself in, in both sport and, and business? Yeah, well, if you look at the high-performing teams, the basic building block is trust. And, you know, the best managers that I have encompassed and the best leaders would all have trusted their team that they would have prepared them in advance for key events, you know, or key decisions or key quarters when you're talking business terms. But they would trust and empower their teams that when the challenge hits and something different happens, I believe that you can respond yourself. So they feel empowered, they feel creative, and they can have that space between stimulus and response where they can actually say, okay, this is what I'm seeing. This is the reality. How can I adapt? What do I need to do now? So that's the best leaders I've seen. Whereas the ones that micromanaged tried to create structures and systems that have to be specifically followed. Yeah, yeah. When it came to crisis, they were, they were stuck. They weren't agile. They couldn't respond. They couldn't adapt. And they ended up not winning using a sporting terminology, but it can happen in business as well. I think I, I, in, I heard an interesting interview the other day, and it was on Brian Ashton, the rugby coach. Okay, so Brian Ashton was the Irish rugby uh, coach in 2008. To tell he only lasted a year, and he was he was booted out. Right now, he is actually advising a lot of Premier League managers on 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 coaching and leadership, and a lot of rugby world rugby manager managers and coaches. You know, is there this thing, Kevin, of the right leader for the right time, or is it the leader is able to adapt and, and you know, from that perspective? Well, I, I, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, to be honest, I've most probably got about 100 books on leadership. <laughs> and I suspect you'll end up with, you know, I, I, in my personal view, if, if you, and I think uh, Shane's point's well made, if you've got someone who's incredibly self-aware, um, understands themselves, understands how they influence and uh, and work with others, is, you know, got the raw horsepower, is bright and able, and has developed themselves. So if they're already leading an organization and they've got those other traits, then they should be able to adapt to most circumstances because, you know, it's about analyzing the situation, creating some priorities of what we need to do, engaging people, listening to views, creating a sense of direction, creating some clarity, and then executing. And executing in most businesses is, is talking to people, inspiring them, trying to get them to understand why we need to do stuff. Now, if you just think about what I said, that sort of applies in most circumstances. I mean, under the sort of extreme pressure in week one and week two of this crisis, I think people just, you know, this was just a shock. You know, there was a there was an element. If you think about the bereavement curve or any kind of change curve, there's that bit of like, what's going on? You know, I'm in denial. I'm not quite sure. Will it be like this? So there's that moment. Now, once you've got through that, 
And I think one of the roles that I've seen HR play is really spending a, a bit of time holding up the mirror to the team. You know, let's just think through what's the critical path? What decisions do we need to make? In what order? What data do we need? And if you then start to do that, and actually you've got leaders that have got those raw um, skills that we talked about, that approach that we talked about, then I think you're going to be in a position where the organisation will be able to respond. It will be able to move up pace. Uh, and it, you know, it's got a better chance of surviving. You know, I don't, I'm not sure in this environment it's about winning. I think it's about surviving so you, you can win later on. You know, this is a, this is a, this is a heavy bit of pre-season, isn't it? You're not really into the game. This is about just, can we get across the, can we get the raft across the river with as many people on it so we can live to fight another day? But even doing that, that's a huge leadership challenge in these circumstances. So I think, I think leaders are made rather than born. I think, you know, there is some natural attributes, but I think it's about learnt behaviour. I think it's about working with others and also understanding. So I've never worked with a great leader that doesn't understand what they're great at, um, what they're OK at, and what they're poor at. Because if by doing that, they enables them to build a team around them that's likely to complement, you know. So if it's a classic in football, isn't it? If you're great you know, you've got some great forwards, you've got people that like talking about, you've got other people that do other jobs in the team. And it's about bringing together a group of people that understand themselves, understand each other. And then you've got the best chance of creating the right, you know, the right decisions and the right um, direction of travel to get you to the other side of the river. Very good. Um, and Shane, you know, in 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 new environments and times of change, like what types of leadership do do people react to best? Um, do you think that you've seen really, you know, the individuals? What do they, what do they like to see from 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 the from whoever's leading their team? Yeah, quite quite simply, it's a clear communication lines and authenticity. Mm -hmm. And I think it was referred to earlier in our conversation that if somebody sees hope, something or honesty, they will respond to that. So being upfront within relation to where the organization is at, what challenges there are in place, who's going to be left yeah. go, why they're going to be left go, the opportunity to stay and come back during the course of this uh, crisis or come back after the crisis, etc., yeah. would probably be the most impactful leadership skill that I've seen and increased communication because in the time of uncertainty, the challenge is for everybody is, what questions, what do I do? Where do I go? What can I work at? Am I going to keep my job? What about my remote work? Can I actually work a computer? I've never worked a computer before, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But a leader that's out communicating more often and has a real finger on the pulse of his team is the one that the team always responds to. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, when, when you were in the Royal Mail, you, I've heard you tell this <laughs> story before about, you know, an organization effectively on the floor losing a million pounds a day you know obviously you've got to make change right you know but but from the point of view of right the organization needs to make change but you've also i presume got to have one eye on how it's affecting the people on the ground because if they down tools or you know don't get engaged you know what i mean mm. or, or keep engaged you, you you lose them you lose the dressing room almost so could you talk us through that sort of process in the royal mail and what you did to sort of keep people engaged and and uh, you know bring them along that on that journey. Well, I think I mean again, you know, if we're uh, the Royal Mail story was a microcosm of a business that had been around five hundred years, command and control. It was you know it was militaristic and it's paternalistic and militaristic. I would describe it as. And when you're trying to turn around a large organisation, we had two hundred thousand people. Um, it's very dispersed, you know, 2,000 delivery officers, 74 factories, 33,000 vehicles on the road each night. So people aren't sat in offices together. They're all over the country. So there was a number of things that we did that I think worked. The first one was we recognized that it was about leaders and managers locally. So our job at the center was to create both the skill and capability. So we had managers that could do what we wanted to do. So we had to develop them at pace. Secondly, was about our job was to talk to the government, get funding, make some business decisions. But in terms of the fundamental change, it was about saying, we're not going to do this to you. We want you to lead this. So managers locally managing their office. Now we had a strong union. 
who really didn't want to come with us on this journey. So it's about getting managers to manage their people in quite an adversarial environment. Um, so we put in lots of coaching, we put in lots of support, but we really reinforced how important they were. So we had big events where we would talk to every manager every quarter. And that took us three days in a big alternium with the chairman and the chief exec and myself every single quarter. Took three days out just to talk directly to our managers. And what we did in that was, and I think it comes from Shane's point as well, is we talked and we created clarity, but we created loads of space for questions. And we then responded to their questions, their concerns. So classic example of that is we would spend an hour and a half with a group of, I don't know, 300 managers. And we would talk for 15 minutes. This is where we are with government. This is where we are with funding. This, what do? You, how can we help you? Tell us. And we had tons of stuff. You know, I can't buy a clock. The bureaucracy gets in the way. This doesn't work. That. So we would then do things like, right, OK, we'll take that away. We gave everyone a budget of 500 quid every month that they could spend on their local office. We basically uh, got rid of processes. We changed how decisions were made. And we then come back and go, right, three months on, guys. That's what we changed. What now do you want us to do? So we kept telling them they were the important people. They had to take our people with us. We were going to be smaller. We were going to have to work harder. But it's exactly the same in a crisis, you know, direction. We know what we need to do, but we're here to help you. You tell us what we need to do and we'll then try and make sure it works for you. So it's a bit like servant leadership. You know, I love that thing in the military. The leaders, the leaders eat last, you know, mm. it's about them. It's not about us. We've got the easiest job. It's the people at the front of the organization that have got the challenges. And the job of leadership is to find a way of creating narrative, purpose, your job's important and we're here to support you. And in a times of crisis, again, I've been saying to leaders all the time, more frequency of communication, do it two to three times a week, do a little bit of talking, update, tell people what you don't know. If you haven't got an answer for it, be honest, be authentic, just say it. And then say, I'll go away and think about it and I'll come back and tell you what we're, where we are. But tell me what I can do to help you. So more asking and listening and responding rather than telling you know turn the turn the telling bit down and get the asking and solution generation you know create some energy and enthusiasm within your people so that they are taking responsibility for sorting stuff out because they're bright they're, they're you know there's tons of creativity ingenuity imagination people can create all sorts of opportunities but your job's to empower them, give them the space tell them it's okay tell them what you want them to do I think, if I remember correctly, did you raffle some cars or something like that? As oh, well? my car story. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and do this one. So this is one of my famous stories. I had to go and sit on T BBC. So we had a big problem with absence and it was, um, we had 12 days a year. And, and if we could reduce one day of absence, so if we could get it from um, 12 days of absence a year across 200,000 people to 11, sort of about somewhere between 40 and 50 million dropped to the bottom line. So we, were, we went through this and looked at our absence policy. So we did the mechanistic bit. You know, managers have got to phone people up on day one, get doctor's notes, occupational health, well-being, support people, all of that. Fine. Union were going, you're just going to beat people up. You're going to drag people a real back to work. You're going to do all those horrible things. And we went, well, no, we're not. We really want to show that we want to do this in the right way. So change management, hard and soft. So that was the hard bit. The soft bit was we basically ran a competition to say that if anyone didn't take a – a day off um, uh, sick in six months, their name would be entered in a hat. We had 31 regions around the UK and we had eight areas of central office and we were going to give a brand new uh, Vauxhall Astro way to the person's name that was pulled out in every region. So we gave 39 cars away, brand new cars. Everyone said we'd never do it. We ran the whole competition. You've got to be in it to win it. We then started drawing out the names. Chief exec and chairman went round, gave cars. We get all the workforce out. So you can imagine outside a big factory or a <laughs> delivery office, chairman turns up with a brand new car, calls out a name, Fiona, there's your brand new car. She drives off, everyone's clapping and cheering. But the point was, it was about, we're all in this. We're all in this. If you can help the business, we're going to reinvest in you. 
we'll train you, we'll develop you. So if you can come do the stuff we know is painful, come with us to the other side. We're all in this together. So it was very symbolic. We then did cruises, we did, but it was all about managers communicating why the business wanted them to do stuff and managing change from a hard and soft perspective. And also not forgetting that, you know, tell people what remains the same. People get obsessed with the change. Like at this moment, you know, leaders are saying, oh, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. Everything's going to change. Tell people what stays the same. Mm. Tell them the bits that are going to stay the same as well as what changes. Because actually we over-communicate the change and don't reassure people. And in terms of this type of crisis, tell people what's going to stay the same. Same team, same organization, same mm. values. We're going to get through this together. Right. We're going to have to do a few things differently. Let's talk about what they are and how you can help us do that. Very good. Um, I think, and I suppose the the topic really for today's webinar is around balancing perform managing performance with 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 workplace well being. And I think, you know, in the last couple of years, like ten years ago, no one had bloody heard of workplace well being. You know what I mean? And and you know, these things come as in a lot of cases in fads and you know we we've, we've lots of different like within our organization in frs across the we we now use lots of different tools and systems to manage to manage that from you know uh lines that people can call if they're stressed etc identifying stress uh, you know identifying problems you know and trying to help people but Ultimately, the, the the business has to, as you said earlier, Kevin, has to survive. Ultimately, that you know, if the business isn't there, there's no jobs. You know what I mean? That's the I think for me the the the, the key premise. And then you move on and you look at that. But at the same time, if people aren't performing to the right level, the business won't survive. And if they're not in the right frame of mind, the business won't survive. So, so Shane, how do we like? It's a, it's a big question, but how do we balance managing performance with our people's um, well-being and and mental health? Do you think? Yeah, great question. Really good. Um, so I think it's a mindset approach to it. And it's actually understanding that people need to thrive as individuals to actually inspire in their roles. So for some organization or for true coaching or true leadership or true events, if they can actually help people to thrive themselves personally, they will be professionally much, much better. So I think it's a win-win from that point of view. So focusing in on okay, what's, what are the events that can help this individual? What can events can help this team to thrive? Like from a capacity of flexible work hours, ability to work from at home, looking at their situation, maybe of working parents, can you adapt systems where they can work at different hours, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that mindset approach is, is a different model than some organizations would, would say that, okay, we're investing in people because we want to make sure that they're well or they're healthy no we're investing in people because we want to make sure that they're healthy so that they can perform to their best for us and for them and it's a win-win so i think the mindset to it has to change in a sense for it to be as impactful as it can be yeah i uh, kevin i had always this so mm -hmm. i'm working in recruitment and allied sort of industries for for a long time and we've almost done some sort of a b tests by by accident in terms of commission versus non-commissioned people and, you know, incentives versus non-incentives. And I think that whole world is really, you know what I mean? It's hard to tell what works a lot of the time. Some people perform regardless of whether you give them an incentive, I think, or not. Other people require incentives, you know what I mean? So in terms of that performance management, managing performance in terms of systems and seeing what's going on has moved on just dramatically 20 years ago i'd walk into an office i'd have a conversation with someone you know what i mean how are you doing i'm doing great how's your figures they give you a set of figures you come back a month later and you go i thought you were going to do that 50k or 100k and then you know oh well this didn't happen whereas today it's all about forecasting you know we understand the projections were much more you know what i mean the data that and you mentioned it earlier is critical to understanding that and so the manager i i don't i think organizations have moved on the mid mid to bigger size organizations i think small organizations have a little bit more difficulty with that but that sort of performance piece you know what i mean what gets people to perform you know do you think yeah I, I, I want to come to the performance bit because I think it's critical, but I think there's a really big message in this well-being v performance thing. And for me, I think an organization, when you're going through a health crisis, right, and this is a health crisis, I think you've got to recognize you've got to find out where people are. 
So one of the things I've been doing all my teams is getting them, everybody to check in a one to five at the beginning of a meeting and then a score at the end of a meeting. So say it's an hour long, one to five. How are people doing? And sometimes I even split it home and work. OK, let's give us a score out of five. Well, I'm a one at home and I'm a four at work. OK, now as a leader, someone a one's low. So one means it's the worst day of your life. Five, it's your best day of life. Most people are in between. But if people give you a one or a two as a leader and a manager, you've got to circle back and find out what's going on. You know, there are people which have, you know, members of their family with COVID in hospital. You have potential bereavements. You have huge anxiety about getting this and not going out and, you know, kids at home not learning and studying. So what you've got to do as a leader is, you, of course, you've got to get to performance. But the first thing is make sure you just listen. You're empathetic to where human beings are. I would say that's my starting point. Right. Just find out where each one, each person is, because if you go, actually, they're being a bit quiet. I don't think their performance is great. Well, their mother's just died. You know, you need to know this stuff before you start getting into the performance stuff. The second bit about performance is it isn't about money. Money does not create great performance. Performance is about it comes from inside. It comes from people. You know, it comes from, you know, it can be influenced. It can be influenced by leaders, managers, work environment, but it's driven by individuals. My great belief is that performance is we spend too much time telling people what they're not good at and not enough telling them what they're brilliant at. Build on people's strengths. Focus on what they're already great at. You know, and keep telling them that. It's a great story about Alex Ferguson that I often talk about. Five to one. His only bit in his leadership book was this bit about five to one, which I thought was great, which is you've got to give people five pieces of positive reinforcing feedback to get them to listen and take on board the area for development. So keep reinforcing what people are great at. Ask them to do more. How can you help them? How do you get better? And at this moment in time, the five to one's critical. So start off with the well-being. Start off understanding where people are, what's going for them. Then start to focus on giving people feedback, reinforcing what they're good at, giving them, you know, praise. Keep telling them that. Of course, you're going to pick up stuff that they're not doing. But don't focus this all on the money. You know, at the moment, lots of people are earning a lot less than they were a few weeks ago. And if you said to them, what's number one? Money would be down about 20. Health, you know, it wouldn't. they wouldn't say well-being. It'd be health of my friends and family. Want to get back to normal. Don't want to get the virus. Da, da, da. So focus, go where your people are. It's interesting. I think if, since 2007, we've been conducting surveys of workers. We get a huge response, about 2,000 responses every time. And, and we, we've tracked, I suppose, that whole piece around what are you looking for from your job? And it changes dramatically as we move from through diff different economic cycles. And the salary piece moves up and down, right? So in good times, salary moves up. And in bad times, it, it moves down. Um, the one thing, and, and this is in good times or bad, it's it's all about the work people are doing, really, the job itself. What, what are you doing more to sort of incentivize people within that job in terms of what it brings to their, I suppose, as Shane talked about earlier, that self-actualization, if you can build that in, regardless of what the job is, I think is important. But I think it's a really good point, Kevin, that that salary piece moving up and down in different times is is is, is really, really interesting, you know. So, Shane, just in terms of, you know, that whole, you know, methods or stuff organizations can be really doing um, to help people on the front line, you know what I mean, with their well wellness and, and mental health. Have you anything in, in, in that area you can talk to us about? Coaching. <laughs> more and more and more coaching. Yeah. But genuinely, it's, it's creating the space for people to actually reflect in a confidential environment where they're trusted, they trust the person that's talking to them, that they can actually think about what do I need what do I value? How is what I do every day aligned to what I value in my life? How is what I do every day outside work and inside work aligned to what I value in my life? Those key questions. And once you have those, that space for people to integrate and become more self-aware. And as Kevin, you just described coaching and the Royal Mail was the number one thing that you did um, at, a, at a massive scale. So, I mean, that that creation of space for people to understand where people are at 
and to help them work out what they need to do to be at their best is really, really powerful in this moment. And as you mentioned, purpose and meaning, um, there was a really good study done in America last year by Better Up, and it was thousands of, of employees across 26 different industries. And they found that nine out of 10 people would have were prepared to relay back a percentage of their salary, their life salary, to gain more purpose and meaning in their work was one of the key findings. So it really, really does matter. If you really are engaged in what you do, it connects to the values and what's important to you in your life, you will go that extra mile or you will get more flow state or you will be enjoyment or you'll be more well and you'll be you know, passionate about what you do. So I think those two or three key variables. Very good. Um, we're, I'm just going to, we've, we've a couple of questions, um, I suppose, from the audience, really. And uh, we, if anyone else has any more questions, stick them in the in the chat there and we'll try and get to them. Um, and of course, when we do that, they move up a bit. But um, so where do leaders go when they don't know the answers? How important is your own personal network work and all of this? Kevin, when you don't have the answers, yeah. where do you go? I think it's a really good question, isn't it? It's, it's a good question. I think I think one of the things that um, I would say this, but I, I do think having uh, non-execs or advisors, uh, I think it comes into its own in a period of crisis because uh, one thing I would say is they tend to be older. They tend to have been around the world. Very old, very uh, old. Very old. Uh, so I think, I, you know, I, I mean, you know, I've been busier than ever. But I've been earning a lot less money. But the point is, you do the right thing, mm. you know. So you, you know, you, you just stay by the businesses and you, you help, you listen, you give feedback, you coach, you, you, you basically give people ideas. But a lot of it's about, you know, creating the right state. So calming people down, getting them to think, getting them to reflect, asking them to think about what they need to do, what are the alternatives, ways of doing that. So I, I think advisors are important. I think, you know, I, I think leaders, um, you know, if they've got a coach or a mentor, that's hugely valuable as well. Somebody that they can just talk to, you know, and someone will listen and ask really good questions, I think is hugely important. Um, I think, you know, people have normally got their own network. You're right. So other business leaders, I think in a, I've seen a lot of business leaders and I've put people in touch and so they have conversations because they may be in different sectors. They may be in different industries. But actually, some of the problems are very, very similar. You know, I've got no custom. There's no revenue coming in. So how do I survive? How do I take my people with us? What do I? So I think there is a lot about making sure you've got objective, um, dispassionate people around you that can help you think things through, give you some advice and help you make better decisions. Really, um, really, really good. And I've just been thinking about this, like obviously, Kevin, we did a lot of work with you probably started two years ago on the whole sort of purpose, you know, values and all that type of thing. And I think it's standing us in really good stead that you have this sort of reference point you're going back to. It's like, what are we about here? Like, you know what I mean? And what's our organization about? And, you know, I think one of those key things is for us, obviously, we're a cooperative, you know what I mean? So um, all the money goes back into the business. But it's not a charity, so you've got to keep the organization afloat. You know what I mean? You've got to make tough decisions. But I think for any leader, it's a brilliant place to be. If you can stand over a decision and say, have I acted fairly here? You know what I mean? I think people like really sort of, you know, even if it's a tough decision for them themselves, you know what I mean? They'll, they'll, they'll take it on board and they'll, they'll row it, you know? I mean, I'll just do a quick one and let Shane have a go. I mean, the thing I would say is your people will never forget the decisions you make mm. during a crisis. Your people will never forget. So if you go, you know, integrity, we're all in it together, whatever your values and behaviours are, whatever you've articulated, whenever you're making a decision, I reckon you get that list up and you look at them. Because if you do stuff which is contrary to your stated values and behaviours, you're going to have a real problem taking people with you because it doesn't mean anything. Because in the moment when they wanted you to behave the right way, you decided to go the other way. So that would be one of my number one things for leaders. Yeah. Whenever you're making a big call, what do we say are our values are? What do we say the behaviors we recognize and, and um, uh, promote? Making sure you're trying to follow through on that is absolutely. And if you really make tough decisions, if you want to talk about being authentic, you make tough decisions using those values and behaviors, your people are much more likely to come with you 
and recognize you're making tough calls, but you're doing it in the right way. It's how you do this stuff, not what you do. Chief execs making a quarter of his staff redundant two weeks ago, phoned up every single person that was being made redundant, every single one, hundreds of people, and said, it's not your fault. We have no choice. I've got to make this decision. If we come out the other side, you'll be top of the list. I'll rehire people. I'll put you at the top of my, but, and people, will people work for that guy again, that business? Absolutely. Because actually he did it in the right way. So tough call, got to get rid of a quarter of my people, but I'm telling you, I don't want to do this. I have to do it. And you know, if I can, I'll bring you back. Shane, uh, just, uh, just, the thought just occurs to me probably in sport you you've, i i presume you've seen really tough decisions been made right with with people who've been you know there a long time and they've been great for the for the for the team probably for yourself you know what i mean i don't know when you know maybe is there any examples you could share with us there where you've seen that sort of happening either to yourself you know what i mean where tough decision you're on the end of it and but you turn around and you go yeah look it's probably the right decision you know yeah, I think it's the way that it's done. So it's you can make the same decision, but you can do it two different ways. So I think there's a great quote that people might forget what you said even or what you did, but they never forget how you make them feel. Mm -hmm. So if you can be just honest, upfront and authentic and tell the individual if they're dropped off a team or they're dropped off a panel and you can say, look, this is the situation, this is why, um, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm getting this one wrong, etc. They will always remember the way you made them feel. I think that goes back to Kevin's point there, like ringing someone up, just being authentic, telling them the truth with no bullshit, forgive the word, and, and people will respond to that because they know how, how they feel and in the future it will come back for organizations and people. Very good. I thought we were going to get some water for dirt there for a minute. <laughs> You're not there, getting that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just another question is um, just uh, probably more for you, Kevin, but, uh, but you can look at it, Shane, as well. How should a business prepare people returning to work after being on layoff? I, I think there's some real challenges with this, actually. I mean, I, I, I've been talking to a few businesses that are starting to go, well, look, we're going to come back, but we know it's not going to come back in one big bang. We know it's going to be a phased return. Now, there's some interesting stuff around here, and I think communicating and, you know, transparency and creating a criteria, because actually we may well be in the, uh, the, the, the place of bringing some people back, bringing some people back on full pay before others, keeping people, some coming into the office, some people working at home. Whereas everyone's been in it together for the last month, I think planning the return it, it requires a bit more thought, actually. So I do think... And it's the same as we've said already, you know, create clarity. This is the criteria we're going to use. We're trying to do it in a fair way, trying to do it consistently. But there's some tough calls and this is how we're going to do it. You know, listen, take some feedback and then go again. So I do think that the return is going to be challenging for organisations because I think you're going to be bringing people back uh, at different times and in different ways. And, and you know, let's be honest, you're going to have social distancing in the office, which means that physical layout is going to be difficult. But don't forget there's real opportunities in this as well. You know, one of the things Harvard did a great study about people that were work remotely. 80% of them are more engaged than employees that work in the office every day. Trust is 62% higher than people work in office because you're trusting people to work differently. So don't abandon remote working. I think we're going to cover that next week, aren't we, Colin? I think. But I think re remote working for a lot. Of... Stealing my thunder there, Kevin. <laughs> oh, but I think remote working is something a lot of people go, actually, this is quite nice. You know, there's a bit of balance. So, you know, I've got rid of the commute. I don't have to drive an hour in and an hour out. I can be more productive. And so what you might want to do as an employer is go, well, actually, do I need everyone in the office? You know, mm -hmm. can I do three days a week in and two days a week off? Actually, one of the other things my clients realized, they're providing longer hours of service to their clients because people have got kids and they don't want to work during the day. So they're going, well, I'm going to open at seven and finish at nine and we're going to change the roster patterns. Clients love it. Staff love it. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. advantages by thinking creatively about some of this stuff. Yeah, we will. I think we'll, 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 let, we'll be covering that next week with Alison Hodgson from, um, from, from Virgin Media. Shane, what, just what's your, I suppose, um, your thought on that? You know, people who've, who've gone into a sort of a stress situation, right? They've been laid off maybe for a couple of months and, and then bringing them back into the work environment. What, what, what sort of steps should organizations take? 
Yeah, great question. Um, I think it's about the individual, first of all, and seeing where they're at. Um, because like in this middle of this environment, people are like, we're always been running on the x-axis where we're trying to get that new promotion. We're trying to get that extra 10% running, running, running. And now because of the current environment, we have to stand and look and say, okay, what do I really value? Has what I've been doing been really important to me? And what do I need to do now going forward? And sometimes there's a lot of challenges around past trauma, past challenges in work environments that they've been in the past that are really coming out now because they have that space. So I think from an organization perspective, if you look at the individual, you connect with them and see where they're at, then you can make and strategize what can you do to actually meet that need. But without that, you're just trying to throw something out in a vacuum that you don't understand what's going to be the most effective. So I think that's what would be a good process there. Very good. I was actually, I don't know whether, I think you were both invited to it. We were due to have a conference today in Crow Park and uh, it just popped up mm. <laughs> in my calendar <laughs> this morning. And I'm going, bloody hell, we're due to have 300, you know, HR leaders in, in Crow Park to announce our, our, our sponsorship with the GAA. Um, both of those things are, are, are both still happening and, and obviously we'll be there. Shane, you'd be delighted to hear Kevin uh, Kevin's family comes from um, from from cashel in, in county tip oh. so, so and uh, you know we, he if he ever had like maybe i don't know some of his grandchildren eventually will have uh, the the blue and gold of tip on you know what i mean and, and that but but shane do you think we'll see ga this year do you think we'll see a championship yeah i'm hopeful colin i think it may be september october time you know but i do think it's important for the irish community you know it's it's uh, hurling and football but maybe hurling i'm more passionate about it's nearly a it's nearly an expression of who we are as a people sometimes and mm -hmm. i know all sport is soccer etc so if we could maybe in confined circumstances with social distancing even if players had to have a medical card to say they don't have the virus yeah. whatever we have to do i think it would be great for the people to have an interest and a passion to move yeah. into that phase of the year yeah yeah, no, that's great. And um, I suppose, Kevin, how do you see sort of I say, sport, isn't it really? It, it's sort of you just when it's not there, you realize how much we miss it. Like, you know, so. Yeah, it is. It's been it's tough. Isn't it? I found yeah. that very tough, particularly as you're spending more time at home. You know, yeah. you put the TV on in the evening watching Sky Sports. I think, well, there's nothing to talk about, is there? <laughs> you know, there's less like there's nothing, you know, other than other players taking a pay cut. When's it coming back? You know, and there's only so much you can go around that conversation. Mm. I mean, I think they're going to, football looks like it will return. We're going to end up with some stuff behind closed doors. I think they'll finish the season in July and August and try and start the new one in September, October. Um, but again, that won't be the same. I mean, watching games on TV without a crowd will be a bit odd, won't it? I mean, it'll, yeah. it'll, it'll feel like a friendly or a, you know, a kickabout in the park, which will be, you know, but I think it's hugely important. I think it, it brings people together. It gives people, you know, there is a distractive element to it, but I mean, I love sports, so I'm missing it all. I'm watching reruns of football matches. My sons, <laughs> I'm educating about the Arsenal team of the 70s and 80s. Yeah, Liam Brady, yeah, very good. So, mm. um, yeah, actually, just on, I, 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 it's a really good leadership piece on um, the Michael Jordan Netflix documentary started on Monday, two episodes each Monday. Um, and they have a, I can't remember the guy's name, but the general manager of the Chicago Bulls, they all hated him, right? But he, he made brilliant trades and all the rest. Really interesting sort of um, story that's going on there. But anyway, I digress. Just to really, our poll, um, I suppose 90% uh, of people believe that we should we should go with workplace well-being before performance management. So um, I think that's interesting. I think people are sort of saying that, you know, ultimately we need to have people's heads in the right places before we sort of, you know, put that sort of performance management structure mm. into place. And I, and, I, and I tend to agree with that. But I think it's probably more 50-50 in terms of how you, how you do that. Um, we have um just in terms of summing up really i suppose um today i really liked shane your your first piece there of getting getting to that flow response you know moving through those different channels um and and that type of thing and and 
that stress is actually necessary for high performance. You know, I think it's a critical, uh, it's a critical part of it, and that widening resilience um, is really important. I think Kevin, you were to, you you were talking about telling people what's going to stay the same. You know, look, we're here. You know, the business is here, and this is the way we're we're looking and keeping keeping talking to them, and you know, really from a mental health perspective checking in you know that one to five where are you on that one to five you know how are you feeling um actually our group ceo i w- walked in this morning it's the first time he's ever said to me how are you actually feeling <laughs> uh and uh it was i was interesting because i hadn't told him we were we we were doing this but it was really interesting and i think what's come out of this i think it's more coaching more talking you know keep talking to people getting that feedback whether it's positive or negative and getting it um true to them and i suppose creating that clarity to make those decisions you know so that and that trust piece in terms of you know and you know sticking to those values that you wrote up on the wall and you know lots of organizations have them plastered all over their walls as you walk up and all fancy offices and that type of thing people will be pointing at those values fairly uh, fairly soon so um kevin thanks a million uh, for for coming on today um as no, always um Shane, uh, really, uh, really informative. Um, how do people get in touch with you, Shane? Is it on on LinkedIn or? Yeah, LinkedIn. So the company is inspiring excellence. So you can connect on LinkedIn or Facebook, and we actually have a new website up and running since yesterday. So www.inspiringexcellence.ie. Brilliant. And uh, anyone who hasn't already got it, Kevin, uh, Kevin has a, a fantastic book, top of five of the Amazon sort of uh, HR books, competitive people strategy. Uh, it's really, really interesting read if you get a chance. Um, and what we might do, Kevin, we might give away a book maybe on, on next week's uh, on, on, on next week program. And on that next week, um, we have Alison Hodgson, head of HR for, uh, for Virgin in Ireland. We're going to be talking about remote work and whether it's here to stay or not. Um, really, int- obviously, it's a it's a really sort of interesting topic and it's very to the fore uh, at the moment. I'm, I'm sure there'll be lots of different. Uh, even this morning, I was talking to people about that in terms of how they see things and you know the that whole. I think we're a social sort of people. We, you know, people are social animals. Ultimately, we like to be able to, you know, get into get in and see people and and meet and that. So um, that'll be really interesting. And we'll. Um, We'll see you all then. Thanks a million. Thank you, Colin.